As if they don't have too much on their plate. The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade. They'll talk about the things they did that day. They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H. If you were Smackdown. 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 Hello, everybody, and welcome to Review of Smackdown. I'm John Pollock, and providing he is here... Bartender Dave. Hooray, I'm I'm here. I I, I promise you that I am yes. fully awake. <laughs> Happy to be joined by my favorite bartender in the world. Oh, thank you so much. I've got way too much coffee in me right now, so uh this should be fun. Yes, you see, uh I'm here at my office space and I just finished a coffee and then right before the show I went to our it's it's a like just your your one washroom we have in this office and once a day the people come and clean the washroom and that's the sign of death i saw so yeah. for so this whole episode you can you can envision that <laughs> i am i'm going to need to pee at some point but we'll have to wait till after this show so just cross-legged and uh, bouncing up and down like the kids do <laughs> well, well we'll see how the how this goes uh how have you been dave how how was the long weekend how was labor day are the the children at school now? Well, as uh, Pete the Cat once said, and I'm sure you being a, f- a new father, you'll get to know this. Uh, these books. Uh, the birds are singing, the sky is bright, the sun is shining, and I'm feeling all right. The kids are back to school. It was a long summer, and I have never been so lonely as I am right now. <laughs> well, Dave, that's why I'm here. I'm here to get you through that uh, the the post summer blues, I guess. Yeah, can 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 you please make this a long show because I really am lonely. I, I said God bless you to my cat when he sneezed today. That's where I am right now. <laughs> that's that's a wonderful thing to have that relationship with your with your cat. What's your cat's name? Juice box. Juice box. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, when we were given the cat, uh, my mother-in-law got it for our, our, our firstborn, Dustin, when he was born, uh, without our knowledge, of course. And I wanted nothing to do with the cat, so I tried to give him the most degrading name that I could think of, so I chose Juice Box. And I ended up loving the cat. I think he's great. Well, we're going to get into the show. <laughs> we're going to chat SmackDown. We're also going to discuss uh, 205 Live, which, uh, for the benefit of all you out there, uh, Dave wanted to watch it, so thus I watched it as well. This is a week <laughs> where you will get a 205 Live review. Uh, yeah, but, sorry about your luck. <laughs> <laughs> but off the top, certainly uh, there is a lot of focus on Global Force Wrestling over the past 24 hours, so I just wanted to quickly update everyone, if they had not heard yet, that Jeff Jarrett is taking an indefinite leave from his role as Chief creative officer due to personal matters which was the extent of the statement that global force wrestling put out on tuesday afternoon and today there is a report out from justin barrasso at si.com with more news on this and what the level of commitment anthem has to global force wrestling and the money losses if they are looking at selling global force wrestling so this is kind of a story that uh, I am working on, that I'm in the midst of, so we don't really have any concrete answers uh, beyond this report at the moment, but I did want to update people on that. Dave, as someone uh, on the outside just observing all of this, of what's going on with Global Force Wrestling, it does mm-hmm. feel somewhat of just this never-ending circle that just remains in a constant state of chaos. And yeah, that, I, has, I, that has been the history of TNA Impact Global Force Wrestling. That has been the thread that has linked all of these various branding uh, names together. It's chaos. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm an outsider looking in on this. And I, I don't really follow the product that much. But everything that I read on online and everything, it always seems that it's a constant train wreck. And like this company has should have died so many times but they keep coming back and they keep coming back but this one sounds like it might be uh i don't want to say anything but it it it, it doesn't look good right now from what i'm hearing yes so just a a quick line here from uh, justin barrasso's report and i uh, encourage you to go read his his full report at si.com and uh, he's a very good reporter stating that uh the gfw GFW is hemorrhaging funds and sources close to the situation have confirmed that Anthem is ready to withdraw itself 
from the wrestling industry and sell GFW. And then it goes into what the the commodities are and specifically noting the tape library. And, you know, if there is, is smoke to this fire, then this could be certainly an industry changing story uh, based on what the future is of Global Force Wrestling. It is either going to remain under Anthem's ownership or they are, as Justin Barrasso reports, shopping around and who are the possible suitors that would be interested would there be any interest to me a story that got almost i would i wouldn't say no attention but very minimal attention last week dave was that they quietly renewed their deal with pop tv for 2018 which to me was the biggest potential um business deal of the year for global force wrestling because with their deal up at the end of the year we were going to see what is the appetite because they need a stronger television outlet that is going to be paying them. And the fact that they just renewed with pop suggests that next year is going to be very similar to this year when it comes to what revenue they can expect domestically. Now, could they have, uh, could this have been in the works, this uh, wanting to unload it by renewing that, giving it something to like some kind of commodity that they could shop around well, like, it, it certainly it, it certainly helps in this whole deal to have television, mm-hmm. primarily in the U.S. That is the market that I think you, you certainly, um, to potential buyers, that would be of interest. Um, so there, there's that side of things that, hey, they renewed this deal. They will remain on television in 2018. However, I, I think to a person, you would, you would expect that pop TV – you understand what the ceiling is. It's a Mm -hmm. very limited visibility where you're talking about 300,000 or less viewers each week. And how can you build up your house show industry pay-per-views on such a small platform? They had trouble with those areas of the business when they were on Spike TV with a million viewers every single week. So it's a story that is developing that we are certainly following at the law and any any news that I can report, we'll be doing so on the website. But I uh, was curious your your own thoughts, Dave, about this uh, ever chaotic story. Yeah, it, the state of it, global force wrestling. Yeah, it's quite it's quite the story. But the big the big news I thought that came out uh, this week was uh, that Nikki Bella is partnered with Artem on the upcoming season of Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, well, far be it for me <laughs> to to bury the lead here that Nikki Bella <laughs> confirmed and will be part of Dancing with the Stars. Is this something? Uh, that you or your significant other might be following. Uh, yeah, we've watched uh, pretty much every single season. Oh, wow. So maybe we can get, so, much like Way provides our Total Divas slash Bellas reviews, maybe we can get your weekly Dancing with the Stars updates. Although, Dancing with the Stars will be going head-to-head with Raw, correct? Yes, they always did, and that's uh, one of the reasons why I started taking the Monday night shifts, because I didn't want to watch it anymore. But, uh, yeah, because <laughs> she's what I made her watch wrestling for the past 25 years, so she started making me watch the Dancing with the Stars, and I actually uh, don't mind it. It's actually really good. Like the season with Jericho, he did a really good job, too. Well, that's a great segue, because mm-hmm. this Sunday night on The Law, our guest will be Chris Jericho. Oh, come on. That's going to be fantastic. He will be chatting about his new book. It is called No is a four-letter word, How I Failed Spelling but Succeeded in Life. That is his (laughs) new book that is out, Life Lessons from Chris Jericho. So he'll be chatting about that and many other topics with myself uh, coming up on The Law this Sunday night, which, with the return of the NFL, to everyone's chagrin, is back. And The Law will be starting at midnight Eastern Sunday night uh, for the full two hours. So that I've is never our, liked that sport. <laughs> the NFL, it does a number on all of us uh, yeah. this time of the year. <laughs> uh, but let us get into Tuesday night's episode of SmackDown from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which, if I'm not mistaken, Dave, was not identified once on this broadcast. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that my top my top question for you was, uh, what city are we in? Because I didn't hear it at all. This was and, this certainly felt like one of those cities where it was stated we will not be identifying this city, which is not uh, a, a a reviewer uh, practicing paranoia. That's a real thing that when they are in markets that they feel are somewhat, I guess, beneath their their level. They will just not state the name of where they were. And Sioux Falls was never mentioned on this broadcast that I heard. 
So, yeah, they've shown that over time and time again. <laughs> the hometown of one Shayna Baszler. Oh, lovely. Now, have you have you watched any of the recent episodes of the Mae Young Classic from this past week? I, I've, I've only seen episode five. Yes, uh, as have I. And uh, but uh, by mistake, I watched the uh, the last bit of the the eighth one too. Oh, so I should have gone in order, but I've I, I watched the last one because like my favorite in the in the whole series was um, uh, Piper Nevin, and I had to see if she got beat out or not. So you you just watched it out of order. Yes, I did. Yeah, I watched the first four, and I thought they were fantastic. And everything that I read are that the the new four, or the the last uh, four released, are even better. So I can't wait to watch them uh, fully. In my never-ending quest to learn the rules of spoilers, I learned a new one on oh. Wednesday morning uh, because I I put, made a post on the website and in the story noted what the finals are going to be, and apparently that's a spoiler, Dave. <laughs> to which someone came back stating that, no, they're not spoilers anymore because the episodes are up. To which the person said, it's not showing on TV, so I think it is a spoiler. So that's a new rule, that if something airs on television, then you can talk about it. But if it is uploaded to a streaming service... It cannot be spoken about. So what's going to happen next week, Dave, when the WWE presents the finals and we haven't watched the episodes yet? Are they spoiling their own <laughs> tournament by having the finals? <laughs> well, I can see I can kind of see what the uh, what the poster was saying about it uh, not being on television as of yet, because like if, uh, in, here in Canada, we have it as a channel and they're putting them out day to day. Like, yes, they, they release them all four, but I've been watching them and recording them day to day because they put them out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday on the network what? as as a uh, like, oh, like if you're watching the network, like I've got it on in the background here. So they are one a night. They're one a night. Spread out over the week. Yeah, like if you but, go but on. But you, you have the option. You could watch oh. them all online. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I can see what he's saying because I'm watching it totally different. I'm not, I'm not binge watching them. As they come up out, I record them and then I watch them. Well, um, I'm checking my eyes and there, there's <laughs> no, uh, there are no tears forming for this person. So uh, <laughs> that is my verdict on that. <laughs> Let's chat about SmackDown from the, uh, from the city that will not be mentioned of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the home, the hometown of Shayna Baszler, who I don't know how she did in the tournament. Uh, <laughs> Thank Tom... you. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Phillips and Byron Saxton are on camera. They mentioned JBL's exit because of his extensive charitable work, and they wish him the best of, uh, the best of luck, and he will always be in the WWE family. And then they welcome in cousin Corey Graves from Raw. Wearing a blue suit it as well. <laughs> well, dressed the part for SmackDown. Yeah. What, what do you think about Corey Graves uh, doing both uh, shows? I, I really like Corey and I like to see him back with Phillips because I, I always love those two together the way that Corey would go after him on NXT. I'm really excited to hear uh, how he does. And uh, I because of listening to, to you every uh, Wednesday f with this report, I even noted the uh, opening line was opportunity awaits tonight. <laughs> oh, opportunity. Yes. <laughs> they confirm that tonight's main event will... Uh, get a title shot at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with Shinsuke Nakamura and Randy Orton. And then we cut to uh, apparently like a, a a pitch for a horror movie where Randy Orton was in this darkened hallway backstage. I guess the electricity was out in Sioux Falls, or maybe they don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. And he asks if Nakamura will rise or fall, because if he's distracted for one second, he will go down. And then he's finally going to take the title away from Jinder Mahal. Nakamura was shown shadow boxing. Literally, we were watching his shadow boxing. And he respects the legend of Randy Orton. He knows how to inflict pain. And he's chasing his destiny. The WWE title and the pain inflicted on the Viper will be felt everywhere. Everywhere, Dave. Everywhere. Even in Sioux Falls. Even in Sioux Falls. <laughs> Carmel and James Ellsworth were inside the ring and they're immediately interrupted by Kevin Owens who comes out and he wants to be the referee for this next match and starts bullying the referee to take his shirt when Shane McMahon comes out and this was when it hit me because every single week Shane gives a what's up blank to whatever city they're in. Tonight it was simply thanks for that everybody. <laughs> 
It just doesn't end. Eh? <laughs> what a what a ridiculous! I don't even want to say what a ridiculous company. What a ridiculous individual Vince McMahon is. That. Yeah, like seriously, it's just a slap in the face to your fans almost. Like big deal. You're in Sioux Falls. You should be proud of wherever you go. You have these fans that are paying money to see you live. Give them that at least. Give them an identity. Did you hear when I when I shared the story about the um, Justin Roberts book and his final conversation with Vince McMahon? Oh, yeah, the uh, oh, uh, make it home safe. No, no, drive yeah, safe. Yeah, it was Justin Roberts <laughs> stating to everyone at the end of the show, drive home safely, and Vince pulled him aside and said, you should say, travel home safely. Not everybody drives. <laughs> that, to me, was the best story. Like, 20 years from now, I, I won't remember all the stories in Justin Roberts' book. That one I will remember. That would yeah. be my biggest takeaway, was that story of don't. not everybody drives. Travel yeah, home safely. I'll never forget that because the following week, uh, what is it, Jesse from the Six, when he posted, he ended it with drive yes. safe. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> a, great, a great Jesse from the Six post. <laughs> Owen says, uh, some, okay, this was when Shane started his promo and says, there is one thing we have to get very clear. And what was very clear was the uncomfortable silence as Shane went Roman Reigns here times 10, he was frozen. <laughs> you have never seen a man thing. panic without making any kind of facial expression. He was <laughs> lost in this promo. And Owens off mic starts speaking to him to get Shane back on track. Kevin Owens was such a pro here yeah, to he help out yeah. Shane and didn't just eat him alive, which <laughs> the precedent had been set last week that uh, could have been done here. But my God, did Shane just look lost here. Yeah, and they were both in front of a big sign that said, Kevin Owen wears pink panties. <laughs> <laughs> Owen starts to blame Shane for his recent losses and no Shane never wanted him on SmackDown, which is fine with Owens because he wants to be back on Raw and everyone booed this. Yeah. I, wonder what, I wonder what Corey Graves felt. Was he conflicted by this? <laughs> Shane says that Hunter gave Kevin Owens the universal title, and it doesn't work like that here on SmackDown Live, and tells Owens to blame himself for all of his uh, shortcomings. Owens asks if Shane really needs all of this attention because his dad never gave him enough as a child, and he gets his kids to dance around for his entrance, and Shane immediately stops him and says to stop talking about my children. Owens then mocks him for jumping off the Hell in a Cell, surviving a helicopter crash and then says his family would have been better off if he didn't survive that helicopter crash he says your dad your wife and especially your two kids would be better off and shane snaps and he attacks kevin owens brawls over the announcer's desk as owens is just covering up the officials have to pull him off daniel bryan is in the middle yelling at shane the crowd is all chanting for shane as he has pulled off, this was a really big angle, Dave. And if you're going to do something to get the guy to snap, uh, this was the provocation to do so, I guess. Yeah, they did a really good job. Like even after the uh, the little flub by uh, Shane uh, Owens, really saved that saved this promo, and I thought he did a good job. But I um, uh, just a quick question: the the helicopter crash. I don't know of this story. Oh, did you not hear about this back in? Uh... I think it was July, where it was the day after SmackDown, and Shane was traveling home in, I don't know if it was a helicopter or just a small plane, but it ended up having to perform like a crash landing into the water. This, oh, man. Ju this just happened in, I think, July. Uh, I, I did not know about that. Wow. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this did happen. This was, a, and got a lot of local coverage, but they didn't. They didn't bring it up on television, uh, on WWE television afterwards, other than a few uh, references, I think, by by Kevin Owens kind of uh, making fun of it, but then really hitting it home here. But that's interesting, the fact that um, you didn't realize that, and I wonder if there were other people in the audience that maybe didn't know the story, because maybe they were not following um, news out of... Long Island that weekend, or that mm -hmm. week, I should say. Yeah, I, I had no idea about it, but I thought I thought it was a really good segment. And uh, Daniel Bryan, uh, he looked great. Like 
dad life is really treating him well. And I, I, I thought it was a real nice touch to, to have him in there shouting at him and then to watch Shane, like you could see he's like, Oh, he plays the, uh, feels shame and heads to the penalty box type thing. When he walks off, I thought that was great. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, frozen stare aside i thought i thought shane owens and daniel bryan all three of them i thought were great on this show this Mm -hmm. this really kicked off this angle and i'm i wonder if bringing up the dive off of the hell in a cell if that's going to i mean do you feel this will lead to a hell in a cell match itself next month um if any of them does well i guess something's got to end up in the cell and like you said uh last week about the uh punjabi prison match and gender you can't put him into a cell uh i'd see this yeah sure why not like i don't want to see shane go off a cell again for sure but no but you've kind of educated people to expect something to top that i think that's going to be the expectation going into mm-hmm. it that i almost i i would personally just rather these two have a a street fight and they can brawl. You can take all the shortcuts. And I think it would be an entertaining spectacle. You put them in the cell, and I think you're going to get the same as the Undertaker match, where the audience will be on their hands until they get out of the cage or get on top of the cage. And you almost have to do that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Like, well, who else would you put in in, in the cell match for that well, show? I, I, I feel that, that with Jinder and Nakamura, they could end up in that match. It's... I mean, it's not foreign for them to do multiple Hell in a Cell matches on these shows. I don't mm-hmm. like that idea, um, but you're right. I don't know what else you would put in there. And the Cell match should probably be what closes the show. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So if not both of these, at least one of them will probably be in that Hell in a Cell. And I don't know if either of these feuds really necessitates Hell in a Cell, to be quite honest. Yeah, it's still a bit new, too, like this one. You you want that to be like a, uh, the third in a trilogy or something like that. Owens is helped to the back, and he's backstage after the break. Brian apologizes and says that Shane McMahon was out of line. Owens tells Brian to enjoy his job while he has it. And Brian says, yeah, I know. I'm counting down the days till this, <laughs> till this deal's up. <laughs> Owens says he's, he's so good. <laughs> He's going to turn SmackDown Live into the Kevin Owens show. He's going to sue Shane, the WWE, and every McMahon member to take this show down. And Brian wants to find another way to work this out. Owens says, I'm going to press criminal charges myself on Shane McMahon. So they're teasing the idea that this could end up with Shane having to battle for control of the company in some ways. Which yeah, makes could... this the most important match whenever this happens. This almost makes it then, if this is for ownership of SmackDown, that this is this becomes a big match to be putting on Hell in a Cell, which seems to be their their theme this 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 month and next of putting almost WrestleMania level stipulations and matches together on these smaller shows. Well, yeah, if you put a stipulation uh, like that on it, it, it ups the ante for that match, and you almost have to throw it into the cell then. And close the show with it. Would you hold this off to Survivor Series, Shane and Owens? I think they have the juice that they could wait that long. Oh, for sure, because both, uh, like, they're they're on fire right now. I, I really have enjoyed Shane over the past uh, couple of months, and uh, Owens is he's untouchable. Like the the reaction he gets when he comes out, it doesn't matter where he is or uh, who who he's facing. He always gets a great reaction. He's always great in the ring and j- just a joy to watch. So I'm looking forward to this. But uh, yeah, you you could easily uh, hold it over till uh, Survivor Series if you'd wanted to. Carmella is back for her already scheduled match with Natalia. They plug next week Natalia defending her title against Naomi in what they are promoting as Sin City Smackdown in Las Vegas. We'll get more into that in the matches they've announced for next week. There, The match begins. There was this extended tilt-a-whirl head scissors by Carmella. The two traded slaps, went through a commercial break. Uh, Naomi is watching backstage. Carmella lands a super kick from the corner, and then Ellsworth tosses the briefcase in with the idea that Natalia is vulnerable and Carmella could just cash it in now. Carmella yells no and gets upset at Ellsworth and distracted, allowing Natalia to roll up Carmella for the pinfall. And Ellsworth is looking stunned after his plan went awry. Now, was, like this was was this for the title or not? Because no, they never really not, said non-title match. Okay, yeah, because I, as soon as he threw the briefcase in, I was like, wait a minute, I thought this was for the title already. So, okay, that would make sense then. I got a bit confused on that. 
but can you interrupt your own match to cash in your money in the bank briefcase? That has never been done. Yeah, that'd be a first. I don't. Yeah, uh, we, I guess we need a money in the bank rule book. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that'll be their follow up to their WWE rule book. Oh, that was god awful. I bought that for my son. <laughs> Is there anything really funny in that? You should do a review of that book. Oh God! I, I Some of the rules that country. no one's ever thought of. <laughs> well, well, as we All learned, right, I'll do it. <laughs> as we learned in the Fatal Five Way tonight on Two Hundred Five Live, that rope breaks will not be acknowledged uh, in a Fatal Five Way. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that was news to me too. <laughs> Carmella is upset on the microphone. She knows James Ellsworth is sorry, and he's the sorriest excuse for a human being I have ever met. In fact, you're not even human calls James a genetic defect and asks how he is still employed. He's a charity case. His mother should have given him away at birth and says they are through and she leaves with her briefcase. So we were we were going for the jugular in our promos from our heels on SmackDown on Tuesday. Yeah, night. for sure. My wife got really excited to see Carmella dump James because she hates him. And I thought it was – I think it's a mistake to get rid of him. I think they work really well together. And uh, James Ellsworth is great as a heel manager. Like he's just I, – I really, really like watching him. Well, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> I don't know how many stay, tu- stay tuned for this one. Dolph Ziggler comes out. He says that the audience has <laughs> no appreciation for what he can do. He's the greatest performer in WWE history, he says. But the people would just prefer some, quote, dumb gimmick. So the lights go out. And he returns with John Cena's music playing and coming out with a John Cena hat and mocking Cena's entrance. The audience boos. He says, well, maybe you want some nostalgia. So he goes back. And he returns with Randy Savage's music alongside a valet and a robe. Didn't get into that one. Nope. So he went back. <laughs> the lights went out. He returned as Naomi and asks if this is what it's come to. A a weak slide onto the knees where the man looked like he was about to tumble down. <laughs> Talks about how it's just come down to hand gestures and costumes. No one can do what I do in the ring. And no one gives a damn about the fans. And says that the fans make him sick. And he walks to the back. And Coy Graves summarized the previous five minutes by calling this, quote, disappointing. Yes, without a doubt. This whole segment made me miss Vicky Guerrero. <laughs> it's the best thing he ever had was Vicky Guerrero. And I'm not a Dolph Ziggler fan. I never have been. I've always thought that he tries way too hard with everything. Like in ring, you always see him screw things up because you can see he's trying too hard. It's just, it, it feels like it doesn't come natural to him. And uh, he just seems to be re-debuting over and over again as himself. Like, like strip him down and give him Nick Nem- Nemeth as a, as a character. Like, just do something, because it's not working, and it never has for me. His title runs were uh, unbelievable to me. Yeah, I, I look at the... You break down this Dolph Ziggler character. I, mm-hmm. I think that there was, especially over time, there was a lot of potential there. There was a lot that could work. But you put it all together. He's been through so many of these one month pushes that are just immediately ignored afterwards. And he's done this so many times. And you're right. The he's got he's got two gears when it comes to his promos. It's either the the joking Dolph Ziggler that doesn't take it seriously or it's the ultra over the top passionate Dolph Ziggler promo and I'm just going to say things like this and to put <laughs> emphasis on every single thing because this is my last chance. It's and a true it's story. Just, it's the boy who cried wolf uh, yeah. here in Dolph Ziggler. And I don't know. With him, I think he could very well use a departure and have a revival, much like Cody Rhodes did from, from leaving the company. And he is young enough that I think he could come back down the road. But hey, he is a prime candidate when you look at this roster where the independent scene is not the it's not the scary environment that I think it was even two years ago to some yeah. guys to leave the WWE for the great unknown. I think yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for guys to look elsewhere that whatever you are giving up, you are likely to receive tenfold in your happiness. And yeah. Dolph would be one of those guys I would be looking at that whenever your deal is due, I would search. I would certainly be kicking the tires at 
alternative avenues. Oh, I, I was about I would have uh, sorry, I was about to say the exact same thing. He'd be number one on my list to leave and try to reinvent himself because he seems like like you, you don't grow without struggle in your life. And it seems like he's just been, you know, like just helicoptered too long, like just coddled. He, he needs something and it's just it, it's boring. It's boring. And I think you're right. He would be fantastic on the Indies, New Japan, wherever, just go there do it come back later on with and he's also one guy that i think he would benefit from the fact he does not own his name because i've always hated that name dolph oh. ziggler i think he could everything about that name to me it would be a positive for him to drop it and become oh, something completely sure. different he i would not want to be dolph ziggler if i even had the rights to use that name outside wwe I totally agree with you. And like even right from when he was debuting and walking around uh, the backstage shaking people's hands, I'm Dolph Ziggler. Right off the bat, you're like, oh, come on, man. That's not your real name. I don't buy this for a second. It's not even a good character name. Sorry, I don't like him. <laughs> Aiden English is in the ring singing and is instantly cut off by Sami Zayn. So they had a match, barely. Mm -hmm. Zayn yeah. had a tilt a whirl head scissors, landed a clothesline, and then missed with a top rope cross body, and English capitalized with a maestral cradle for the win in all of 64 seconds. Sami Zayn. Yeah. May maybe in six months we'll be having the same conversation about him as the last guy we just talked oh, about. Oh, God, I hope not, because there is so much potential in Zayn, and he's so smooth in the ring, so good on the mic, and he's just, uh, I, I love everything about him. He, he is the most underutilized guy on oh, either Raw or SmackDown at the moment. For sure. And this is, what, two weeks in a row we've heard Aiden, English, Aiden English's music. <laughs> hey, you want some breaking news? What's that? Do you know? Do you want to know what the gate figure was from Mayweather and McGregor, which I just got? No, what was it? What was it? 13,094 tickets sold with mm -hmm. a gate of $55.4 million. So it was oh. not the record-setting number of $72 million that Mayweather McGregor was. Wow. That's uh, uh, it's still still respectable. I'd like a chunk of that. <laughs> so Seriously, I could use it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate with Sami Zayn. I, I'm with you. I feel this guy has so much crossover appeal. He is one of those performers that, uh, whether you are just a fan of the person, uh, like this is just a generally very good human being out there mm -hmm. on top of being a tremendous performer. Um, just someone that's been lost on SmackDown and it feels is just an afterthought now on the show, yeah, which is very true. unfortunate. Oh yeah, for sure. Because he's and, got, and he, sorry to interrupt, but he's yeah, not, no he's not at a position yet where you feel he's, you know, he's like, there's so much there. He's not at a point where you're giving up on him. Like, it's not like he's damaged goods, but you continually put someone in this position, you have the problem that you have with Adolf Ziggler where they have seen him slotted for so long that it becomes very difficult to get out of that positioning. Yeah, especially with a match like this and losing so quickly and cleanly to uh, a guy like Aiden English. Although I did like Sammy chasing him up the uh, the rampway. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, that was afterwards <laughs> where he just chased him to the back. So I guess at least it's a program, um, a low yeah. one on the SmackDown totem pole. Yeah, quite. Daniel Bryan's in his office. The New Day enters wearing their New Day boxers that are now for sale. Uh, the Usos then enter, and they're here to announce the stipulation for their tag title match next week in Las Vegas which they repeatedly called Sin City. So maybe that's going to be, that'll be our experiment for next week if it will be called Las Vegas or just Sin City for yeah. two hours. Yeah, and then they're going to trademark it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're going to have a street fight, plain and simple. Uh, it will obviously be, be uh, Big E and Kofi Kingston, given Xavier Woods' uh, knee injury. You would assume he will not be part of the match. Mm -hmm. And Big E ended by saying, they are the dealers and the Usos are about to bust. And... If they get time, that should be a phenomenal match next week because all their prior matches have been. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And like uh, the New Days, uh, they're they're doing well, but the Usos, I just absolutely love them. They they found this these characters and just brought them just so fully. It's 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 beautiful to watch uh, somebody or like a team to actually grow the way that they have and become this new this new entity that they are. I, I love what they've done and what they do in the ring. They're really, really good. And uh, my wife told me that I'm getting a pair of those shorts for my birthday. Oh, that's exciting. When's your birthday? Yeah. November 28th. 
Oh, look at that. Exciting. <laughs> Brian then receives a phone call. You want me to do what? In the ring? <laughs> I already crazy. retired, Vince. <laughs> and then he, repli- re- he follows, sir, there has to be another way we can handle this. Who is the mystery figure on the phone? And that was our, our big uh, tease going to break. And we came back with Brian out, and he calls Shane down to the ring. Brian brings up the incident on Talking Smack last year where the Miz berated him and kept pushing him and pushing him on TV, and he constantly wanted to headbutt him in the face. But he didn't, because Shane told him as the general manager of SmackDown he had to put WWE first and the fans first, along with the employees, which, I mean, asterisk, independent contractors. Yes. Shane has, thus they're working Christmas, at least on Raw. (laughs) I work every Christmas. (laughs) Well, Shane has put Brian in a tough spot. He says he understands what he did tonight, but he went into a blind rage when he brought up his family. And he says, Brian, as a new father, what would you do if the shoe was on the other foot? Brian says there's other families to think about in the WWE. And Shane says, I will handle this. I will speak to Kevin Owens. But Brian says it's too late for that. He got a call from Vince McMahon. And Shane is indefinitely suspended. And Shane just took it all in. The crowd was chanting for Shane. They started chanting, thank you, Shane, as he exited. And, hey, Shane came off as a mega babyface on this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. I, I really like this segment. Like, right from the start with Brian coming down, no music, super serious. And uh, That's, a, that's a great point, the fact Shane just came out. Uh, without music. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, and it was it was just, I thought it was really uh, good. And my favorite thing was uh, Shane just owning up and taking full responsibility because people don't do that in life anymore. I just, I thought it was great for his character. Like you said, a mega baby face, and I thought it came off really well. Yeah, th- I, I'm really enjoying the angle. I know some that, you know, maybe are going to complain about Oh, he's got a sell for Shane McMahon. I mean, that's how you've, you've got to kick this thing off. And mm. I, I thought this was executed really effectively on, on Tuesday night and and milking this thing for to for the eventual match down the road. And I'd be perfectly fine if they held off until Survivor Series with this. I think it's a compelling enough program that you don't have to rush to the ring in four weeks time at Hell in a Cell. Oh yeah, it's got a lot of juice left in it, like you said, and uh, and it, I like it's it's very entertaining, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. So why not stretch it out? They they could they could make it last, no problem whatsoever. Renee Young was backstage with Jinder Mahal and the Singh brothers. Jinder says all the hype and social media buzz meant nothing for Shinsuke Nakamura when he faced him. There's a reason the New York Times are writing about him. He's proven that he's the greatest champion of all time. And he will be watching tonight's main event very closely. AJ comes out for commentary as Baron Corbin took on Ty Dillinger. Yeah. (laughs) Corbin goes to the floor. Hey, what did you think of last week's 49-second match with AJ and Ty Dillinger? I thought it was one of the best sub-one-minute matches I've ever seen. Was I too high on this 49-second interaction? Okay, to tell you the truth, I don't usually watch... um... Raw or SmackDown. I have Raw playing because I work every Monday night. I have it playing on the back TV in the bar, so I'll watch it like that. Uh, And I usually don't watch SmackDown. I I, uh, wait to listen to you guys talk about it. But when you said that about that match, I actually, like I PVR them all just in case I do want to watch them. Yes. And I watched that match and you were spot on. It was a really, really good match. Like, yeah, quick. uh, But it was, he, he, Ty portrayed this character that needed to go real fast because Corbin was just right there. I thought it, it, it came off beautifully. I thought it was a really good match. Like, as good a match as you're going to have in that amount of time, that is really impressive to me. I mean, it's one thing mm-hmm. to do, you know, you get your 20 minutes. Certainly you have a different expectation level. I find it equally impressive to have that kind of a match in such a short amount of time. So, oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, and uh, anyway, getting into this match... Corbin went to the floor immediately to get into AJ's face. Dillinger then landed a suicide dive, threw him into the barricade. They get back inside. Corbin uh, swung around the post, nailed him with this clothesline. He took over, and Dillinger comes back later with stomps in the corner, set him up for the tiebreaker, which Corbin blocked, and then kicked Dillinger to the floor, sent him into the barricade, and the referee gets in between them, and Corbin strikes him in the throat, uh, which puts Dillinger... uh, 
he's le- he's leaned over as he then gets knocked into the LED post, and Baron follows with the end of days to get the win. Yeah. I, th- I thought Dillinger looked good in this. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this, he, is, this is a guy that gets very little, and he, he maximizes his time in the ring. Yeah, it's, he's this, a great, this was no 49-second classic. but hey. No, no, but he did do a good job, and he had a different partner. Like, And and everybody knows that Corbin is like one of my favorite guys. I've, I've always liked him. But it just seems like they're really trying to sabotage him right now. Like even from the the changing of his music, his music was awesome. And like even the, the the titantron that they had with the the buildings falling, the destruction, I thought it was great. Now they've got this generic crap for him, you know. And I ate a lot of crow when, when Corbin lost his briefcase, you know. But it, it just, I the, they've just lost faith in him or something. It just seems really really odd. It seems that though, it's not like they've dropped him cold. I mean, he's mm-hmm. still in a program with a prominent star in AJ yep. Styles. But you can't argue that there was any positive that came out of the briefcase loss. I mean, that oh. did nothing for anybody. It didn't help Jinder in any way. To me, it didn't help the 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 match with Cena. It did nothing. All it yeah. was was let's get rid of this this toy. That was yeah. it. It was if just you, a, hey, we're not going to do anything with this. Let's get rid of it. Yeah, and if you, if 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 you want to get rid of or get it off Corbin, they they should have had a match for the briefcase. Agreed. And somebody else should have got it because like to lose the money in the bank briefcase is it, it's it's such a great storyline and a great thing for somebody to have. Like even give it to AJ or something or uh, Owens. It would have been better than just dis- dismissing it altogether. I thought it was a, a, a mistake on their part. Yeah, I, I almost would have loved the idea of Cena winning it right before he leaves and you could even have him get detoured. He goes to Raw, and he doesn't even bring out the briefcase. And that can be setting up his WrestleMania angle. When he returns to SmackDown, and we've all forgotten that this guy's got the SmackDown briefcase that he hasn't even been carrying around on Raw or when he takes off. Um, anything. It's like there was no gun to your head because this thing is good until June. Like, yeah. you can come up with an idea for something that has a a material benefit for some performer on your roster if it's not going to be barren. Yeah, that scene idea would have would have been beautiful. I, that, that'd be great. Just anything. I mean, just yeah. to, you're, you're going to have to have a title match at some point. Utilize the briefcase for it. Mm-hmm. Styles met with Dillinger backstage and says it was a good fight last week, and tonight Corbin used cheap shots to beat him because that's what he is, a cheap shot artist. And says next week the U.S. title open challenge is only open to Ty Dillinger, which would be the exact definition of a closed challenge. Would it yeah. not, Dave? Like, this yeah. is a pretty exclusive open challenge, isn't it? Um, open challenge. Just to you, though. Yeah, it's all you can eat. Uh, <laughs> it's the vegan all you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> and they agree to have a match in Sin City next week, so uh, I'm all for this. We'll get another Styles Dillinger match next week, which that brings us up to three title matches for next week, and we will see how everything is paced, because certainly I hope the tag title match gets some time. I also hope this match gets some time. Yeah, I agree, but they're really, really loading this show. Is uh, Are their numbers down or something? Uh, I mean, last week they... Just taking a look at recently i mean not not awful i mean they typically do about two and a half million viewers last week was slightly below that i mean it's not as though numbers have been off what they have been doing Mm -hmm. um to me if if anything it's raw that i would be beefing up because next week monday night football returns and that's giant competition as compared to what they face on tuesday nights but next week certainly smackdown is the priority show i mean there's there's really nothing built up for, for next week's raw uh, maybe think. that's uh, they're already taking it like, OK, we're going to get slaughtered on Monday. So let's make uh, Tuesday's show that much bigger so that uh, it brings people back into the fold. They just aired a video feature on Bobby Roode. That was his only um, appearance on the show was done via video. Uh, Ellsworth is backstage. He's beside himself, approaches Carmella. He admits he messed everything up. He is a freak. He's subhuman and he belongs in a zoo. <laughs> but he begs for another chance. He's just going to stay quiet and not get in Carmella's way. She says, for now on, they do it her way. And she brings him in and makes out with Ellsworth. 
and then slaps him. <laughs> Some guys are into that. <laughs> so what, what is this going to be? Is this like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I left with like this kind of like dominatrix vibe here from yeah. these two afterwards. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe Vince McMahon watched a one match of the May Young Classic and his giant takeaway was that, that ponytail whip that Bianca Belair does. That's a great way to get some heat with a whip. <laughs> Especially if it was to a guy. <laughs> Who would I love to see get whipped by a woman? That oh, fucking guy. That Ellsworth, Ellsworth guy. Ugh. <laughs> by the way, I have been super impressed with Bianca Belair in the yeah, Beyond Classic. Was great, I think eh? she has been one of the the best uh, participants to come out of that tournament. I see her as having tons of potential down the road. Yeah, without a doubt. And like I can, she's got ridiculous abs too. Just insane. Yeah, I've only seen the fifth episode of the new ones, but that main event with her and uh, Kyrie Sane was perhaps my favorite match of the tournament. It was excellent. Ten minutes, yeah. it's tremendous. I mean, you have an expectation level with Sane, but to me, Bianca Belair was just great in that mm-hmm. match as well. Yeah, if she doesn't get signed, I'll be really surprised. Oh, I, I think she's a can't miss to, <laughs> yeah. to be signed. Um, Shinsuke Nakamura and Randy Orton was the main event with Jinder and the Singh showing in the skybox. Orton went for the RKO almost immediately as Nakamura bolts away to the corner. Nakamura did his uh, pose where he just leaned onto the chest of Orton, who grabs it and tries for the draping DDT, which Nakamura avoided. They went through the commercial. They're on the floor. Nakamura gets dropped onto the desk. Nakamura then came back, hit a running boot, kicked Orton in the chest repeatedly. But then on the final one, it gets caught and... Then Nakamura hit an insiguri with the other foot. Orton then stopped Nakamura on top, landed this great-looking superplex where Randy got right onto the top. Mm -hmm. Nakamura kicked out of that, delivered a series of knees to the body. Orton is all dazed, sets up for the Kinshasa, and then runs at him and is hit with a power slam from Orton for a two-count, followed that with a draping DDT. Uh, I thought these two just worked together so well with so many of their spots, and this was uh, the best of Orton. Uh, working with an opponent that could work with him very effectively. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. This I thought this was uh, uh, Nakamura's best showing since he came up to, since he came up to the main roster. I thought it was a really good match. Yeah, he called for the RKO. Nakamura countered that into the armbar. Orton has his hands clasped, so Nakamura turned it into his Nakamura triangle, which is pretty much just a high guard. Uh, crowd is chanting for Randy. Nakamura gets slammed out of the triangle. Blocks an RKO with a backstabber, calls for the Kinshasa, and just like that, hits it with Corey giving his big call, and Nakamura pins Orton clean to get the title match at Hell in a Cell. I love the fact that there was no bullshit to the finish. Um, Yeah, this was a great match. Really strong main event. I would say two really great main events from Raw and SmackDown this week. Yeah, well, without a doubt, I I completely agree. And um, the... I. Like you said, there was no bullshit. And when it started, the first thing I thought was, wow, we're going to end this in a three-way for the belt at uh, at uh, the pay-per-view. But they did. They went through it. They they had a really good, hard-hitting match. It was super smooth. Uh, the Kinshasa didn't look as good as I would have liked to, but, you know, you can't hit it all the time perfectly. Uh, and the, the you brought up the superplex. Like, that was just phenomenal. Like, that, it was his dad who used that as a finisher, right? Yes. Yeah, and it's it was just beautiful. Thought it was yeah, a great match. It looked great. Mm-hmm. Then at the end, Brian confronted Owens backstage. Says Shane's been suspended. It's all done. Owens says it's just getting started. Next week, he will make SmackDown his playground and Brian's nightmare. Brian says someone's coming next week to address this situation, and it's Vince McMahon who will return to television. So SmackDown extremely loaded now with the return of Vince McMahon to television. Yeah, I can't wait for next week's show. And it, it's nice for them to uh, uh, build up a, a show coming like the, the the following week's show because they don't really do that that often anymore. And this this was really nice to see, and it got me excited. I'm definitely going to watch next week for sure. Yeah, this I mean next week. I mean, it really feels SmackDown is uh, the priority show, mm-hmm. and and Raw had a very good summer of numbers, and it'll be interesting to see how much of that they retain going into the fall. Um, with football competition, and the fact is, I mean, last year, they really got slaughtered on two fronts. It was football, and it was also 
all of the coverage going into the election that I think, uh, you know, just cable numbers as a whole were just up so significantly that I think ate a bit out of the raw audience as well. So Mm -hmm. um, that'll be something to watch as well. But uh, I found this to be a pretty good SmackDown with a great main event. And I really enjoyed all of the stuff with Shane, Brian and Kevin Owens throughout the show. Those are your um, your two big programs, uh, Nakamura and Jinder in a rematch, and eventually getting to Shane and Owens. The question being if that'll be at Hell in a Cell or saved for a, a Survivor Series. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the show too. I was I was kind of scared that it might be a stinker, but like that that uh, main event really really saved it. They brought it for the unnamed city. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> it's a good thing they didn't say Sioux Falls, or else it would have sucked. Yes, it was the rise of Sioux Falls <laughs> on Tuesday night. What did you think of Corey uh, on SmackDown overall? Uh, good. Listen, I really enjoy Corey Graves. Um, you know, I I guess there's some that could look at the fact that I don't think there's anyone that looks at this brand extension as anything of, you know, a brand ex- other than it's that. It's a brand extension. It's all under the same umbrella. I don't think yeah. anyone really cares. Um, I, I want to hear the best broadcast team and Corey certainly enhances whatever broadcast he's a part of so yeah. uh it's it's a good team it's also i noted this the fact that it's such a young team you have on smackdown with um with the three of them i mean mm. for, for the main roster i mean when you look at just the different teams you've had over the years i mean this is one of if not the youngest when you look at the ages of Corey, tom phillips and byron saxton like i was shocked to see tom phillips is 28 years old yeah, that's that's a lot younger than I thought he he would have been. And they 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 called NXT together too, all the three of them for a while. Yeah, exactly. So um, mm-hmm. it's, so they got the chemistry. Yeah, and it's kind of you know it's it's cool to see that NXT team that has moved up now and is now the full team on SmackDown. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I I like the announced team. I think it's a it's a benefit for Corey to be on that show. Now, conversely, 205 Live also got a shakeup with this because Corey Graves is no longer doing 205 Live because the man is only human. Yes. Uh, he is uh, going to be replaced by Nigel McGuinness, who joined Vic Joseph, and they're going to be doing main event as well. They did it on Monday. And before we get into the actual show, what did you think of Vic Joseph and Nigel on Tuesday? Um, I love Nigel McGuinness. I love his commentary. I love how... Uh, his heel commentating role is he does it so well and so like it's just it's like a second skin for him like I, I miss him wrestling and I love seeing him in this role I love him on NXT and I thought he did a really good job on uh, 205 Live made it a bit more uh, it felt a bit more uh, I don't know like bigger with him I thought he did a really good job but I have never okay so I haven't watched 205 Live in a long time I've never seen this Vic Joseph guy before. How long has he been on? Oh, he's been on for several months now. He Oh, really? He used to do House of Hardcore when we aired it on the Fight Network. He was a uh, uh, I'll butcher his last name, but it was like a Vic Traglianti or I, I I will I'm destroying his last name. But anyway, he called House of Hardcore before he was signed by WWE, but he's been doing it I guess he was uh, like Moro stopped, I guess mm-hmm. in March, and I don't know if Vic Joseph started immediately afterwards or if there was a buffer where Tom Phillips was doing it with Corey. I think that's what happened, and then Vic, I would guess maybe two months after that, so he's probably been doing it since late spring. Yeah, because I remember uh, Corey and uh, Phillips doing it for sure. But this Vic Joseph guy, he's solid. He did a really good job. Yeah, he's he's good in in the yeah. role. Yeah. Uh, so we started things off with TJP and Arya Davari, where TJP had been going around in a wheelchair with a knee injury that <laughs> I figured last week was concluded was a fake injury. Yeah. And then he works his <laughs> match, and the announcer, like, t- Vic is trying to ask if his knee is really hurt, and Nigel is not convinced he was faking it. So you had certain times in the match where he's selling the fake injury and others where he was just doing his regular offense. So I don't know what the hell this story yeah. is and what we are supposed, what, what we are supposed to feel here. Yeah. Well, I thought it was like uh, pretty conclusion or uh, uh, solid that it was not hurt last week. This guy did like, a even flip the, off the ropes like he was Shawn Michaels in 97 coming back from his quote unquote knee injury. Yeah. And he hits the ropes with that leg 
on it fully. And it's like, well, obviously it's not her. Like this was, he was just playing a game, but I don't know. <laughs> bit, bit confusing. So it's TJP and Arya Davari. Davari did an insert promo calling TJP a scrawny little boy, and he's going to inflict pain, so he needs those crutches again. Then Rich Swan came out with popcorn, and he placed a chair on top of the announcer's desk and just sat there for the entire match. Yeah, I, thought, I was just I felt sorry for uh, Nigel and Vic because they, uh, they you those see should have been like fuck this. You yeah, call the match, Rich. Looking down, they can't. They, all they all they can see if they put their head up is his butt, and it's just like oh man. <laughs> Davari kicks the knee out on the turnbuckle and hits an inverted DDT for a two count. So this either aggravated the fake knee injury. Or it didn't. Yeah. Vic, <laughs> Vic says the people in the locker room think the TJP may be milking that injury. And this is where Nigel, he's not so sure. Davari <laughs> misses a top rope splash and TJP lifts him up and hits the detonation kick for the win in four minutes and two seconds. And then Swan gets into the ring telling TJP that he hopes he's ready for their singles match next week. Which is going to be their rubber match. Yeah. Yeah, Which, two weeks, two weeks in a row that Davari looks like a total loser. <laughs> the most notable part of this segment is the fact that they are doing 205 Live next week, the same night that they're doing the finals of the May Young Classic. So I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, like that. I I thought the exact same thing. I'm like, I thought it it was on right after SmackDown, but it's like what? <laughs> like you figure the finals of the May Young Classic, they're gonna go all out for this match. Oh, and for sure. do the big celebration at the end. It would be very hard to then follow that with an entire episode of 205 Live. My suggestion would be to tape 205 Live before SmackDown. The problem with that is that they're on the West Coast next week, which would mean that that would be taping 205 Live at like 3.45 in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Imagine what that crowd would look like. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if that's the best idea, um, to be expecting your Las Vegas crowd to be coming to the arena for 205 Live to be taped before SmackDown. However, the idea of doing 205 Live in its normal slot and then doing the Mae Young Classic at the end of that seems like way too much, and you run the risk of a half-empty building for the finals of your Mae Young Classic. Yeah, I, I, like no way would they do that. The, I, I can't see them doing that at all. So like it's it's, it's going to be right after SmackDown on that show, right? Like it's not going to be on the SmackDown show, but it, in the same arena. Yes, it's supposed oh, okay. to be on the WWE Network right after SmackDown, which if I was doing this, I would have just put the finals on SmackDown. Yeah, for sure. It's, have it's, the it's biggest a big audience possible watch this. I mean, you're in, you're in Vegas. I mean, there's the potential you could do an angle with Ronda Rousey, why would you not want to do that on television? Um, Not saying they will, but if that's an option, I would certainly want to do that on television. And especially if you're building to something big with Shayna Baszler, which they're clearly working towards with the horsewomen angle. So that would have been my call to just make the finals part of SmackDown proper rather than just making it its own thing on the network. What what, what kind of time do you think they're going to give that, uh, that match? Like about 20 minutes, maybe? I'd say, yeah, at least 15 to 20. Yeah. Like, yeah so they could do that and uh, then just throw on 205 right after it. But, yeah. That's that's a long night. Yeah. But, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Drew Gulak is passing out pamphlets backstage and makes his entrance with the megaphone. And he cuts a promo about making 205 Live better. And throughout all his struggles, he was not able to gain a spot in tonight's Fatal Five-Way. He's being stifled for a title opportunity. So he's prepared a PowerPoint presentation for his plan for a better 205 Live. And the screen, which looked like every PowerPoint presentation out of the early 2000s. This was great. It was and so good. the best part was having slide one of 277 <laughs> listed. I thought this was great. The first slide was no jumping off the top rope, which the fans booed. Slide two was no jumping off the middle rope. And then he gets cut off. When he goes for the third slide. Uh, I love this. I thought this was great. One of my favorite Drew Gulak segments he's done. Oh, yeah. And he's he's so improved over over the time that he's he's uh, been on 205, 205 Live. I really like his character. He he plays it great. And, like, I'm a really big fan of his. And my favorite part was still to come. <laughs> and he's also since posted 
Uh, because Tozawa interrupted my PowerPoint presentation, I will now not be posting the slides online. I apologize <laughs> for his unprofessionalism. Love this guy. <laughs> I think he should have done the opposite. I think he should have just started posting slides, slide by slide of all his rules. Yeah, and just uh, tag uh, Tozawa in every single one of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then he had a match with Akira Tozawa. Gulak yanked him by the arm off the apron. All of his offense was submissions, grounded offense. Tozawa then landed a right hand and followed with a Hurricane Rana, booted Gulak to the floor and hit his suicide dive. Tozawa goes then uh, goes to his back, hit a rolling bridge for a two count, landed a roundhouse kick, uh, went back to the top rope and hit a senton and won the match in six minutes, 39 seconds. Yep, but my favorite part of the whole match was when Gulak had uh, Tozawa down and he jumped on the bottom rope to get a little bit higher to do the stomp on, on Tozawa and uh, um, Nigel pointed it out. That wasn't one of the on one of the slides. It's okay. <laughs> They've also gone very cold on the whole Titus brand stuff since the yeah, Neville that's... program ended. I was wondering where he was too. And why was Tozawa not part of the, the five-way if he was like a former champ. You'd think that they would have thrown him in there, too. They're very hot and cold with their cruiserweights, and I guess oh cold God. on Tozawa at the moment. Yeah, well, he should have never won that title off of uh, uh, Neville. Neville is, is he's just pure money, and I uh, I think that really hurt. It didn't help Tozawa that much at all. If I don't think it helped him at all, at all. At all? How many times can I say at all? At all. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Dasha is with Enzo backstage, and... <laughs> The idea is he's going to work smarter, not harder. And his strategy has led to him being 3-0 and in cruiserweight matches so far. He's got the gift of gab and jab. And yes, he didn't travel the indies for 10 years, but all of them ended up in the same place. So who cares? Yeah. He's using his certified GPS to put 205 Live on the map. Calls Grand Metalik Nacho Libre. Ouch. And, and then Neville walks in. You're sure amusing, aren't you? He says 205 Live is an arena for real competitors and serious athletes. Enzo is not serious. He has no business entertaining ideas that he belongs in the same ring as him. So Enzo calls Neville Frodo. This isn't Game of Thrones, and at no mercy, that title is going to be his. Yep. <laughs> Enzo seems chemically imbalanced to me. Like, legitimately chemically imbalanced. Some of the things that comes out of his mouth and the, the way his eyes go dart side to side, it's just, he's, he's a real weird dude. Well, he's, he, li he's literally imbalanced when he's in the ring. Yeah, like, he, hit every, he hit every one of his catchphrases in that, that little, what, 30-second promo he did there. <laughs> so the main event is our fatal five-way. Cedric Alexander, Enzo, Grand Metalik, Tony Nice, and Brian Kendrick. Enzo got to cut his usual promo at the beginning, and then he goes to the floor and lets the others fight it out. Then the ring gets cleared. It's down to Alexander and Nice, and Nice catches him with a gut buster, goes for a dive. Enzo comes from behind with a roll-up, and Kendrick then takes Enzo off the apron, suplexes him to the floor. Nice is working over the back of Enzo, who came back and hit a tilt-a-whirl head scissors to Nice, and then fought off Nice and Kendrick and takes a running kick to the ribs from Nice when he returns. Alexander hit this great-looking Spanish fly to Metalik. Everybody's down. Tower of Doom spot with everyone involved, minus Enzo, who of course. may have killed himself <laughs> taking this, uh, with Metalik delivering the Sunset Powerbomb superplex to Nice, Alexander, and Kendrick. Neville is shown watching backstage. Enzo gets thrown over the announcer's desk. Kendrick and Nice agree to work together, but then Kendrick attacks him from behind. Metalik hit a springboard swanton to Kendrick on the floor, and then Nice took out Metalik. And then, in something I have never heard, the ch the wonderful people of Unnamed City started chanting 205. Yeah. That's it was that. not a ton of people, but it was notable. <clears throat> yeah, I thought the exact same thing. There was actually uh, this is awesome chant during this match and a holy shit chant, chant as well. I couldn't. That's got to be a first for 205 Live. <laughs> nice then sets up Metalik in the corner. Alexander returns, hits the lumbar check, and he pins Nice to which I thought Alexander won the match and then realized yeah. this is an elimination match. <laughs> <laughs> then there was a handspring in Zaguri to Kendrick by Alexander. Metalik handspring is caught. Alexander hits another lumbar check, eliminating Metalik. Then Kendrick hits the sliced bread to Alexander, applies the captain's hook, but 
Cedric is able to roll back into a pinfall. Captain Captain's hook gets reapplied in the middle of the ring, and this is where Alexander reaches the rope, but McGinnis explains that he can't break the hold because there's no disqualification. So Alexander drops Kendrick on the edge of the apron back first and then a lumbar check inside the ring to eliminate Kendrick and then Enzo runs from behind, rolls up Alexander while grabbing the trunks and Enzo wins in 1451 to face Neville at no mercy. Yeah, that um, I loved this match. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was well put out or uh, thought out. And right from the beginning, like right, I, I, it, it had me hooked right from the beginning. And I thought it was probably the, uh, my favorite match of the night, like including SmackDown. I thought it was so well done. I loved everybody in this. Uh, the only one I didn't like was Kendrick. I thought Kendrick looked like an idiot. Because <laughs> like, I always hate when two people in an elimination match or even like a rumble or something – decide to go against each other and then one of them stabs him in the back immediately why wouldn't you wait until you're the last two in the ring it just it just makes you look like an idiot but i love the match i thought it was great yeah i've got to say i mean this kind of followed the uh, raw smackdown and 205 live all having pretty solid main events i i did enjoy orton nakamura more than this but they did a really great job and given that slot on 205 live they have so much more working against them that mm-hmm. i think it's even more impressive that they got the reaction they did and worked a really strong match. Um, it leads to a match that, not dying to see, there's part no. of me that wants to see Neville and what he can do with Enzo, but it's hardly... I mean, Enzo is the most over guy on this show at the moment, so they're, yeah, going, they're going with the hot commodity, and it would have been the wrong call to go with anyone but Enzo in this match. I mean, why cool off the the hot new character on 205 Live? So it makes all the sense. That, like, that's the reason he's here. It's... Mm-hmm. It's not so much that you're getting a great match, but we've had we've had nine months now of trying to just put on great matches, and we've seen what the results have been. So they're doing something different. Yep, they are. And like I, I always feel bad for these guys like, uh, because it, it seems that uh, they 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 were sitting on a gold mine with the CWC, but when Creative got a uh, hold of them, the ball wasn't just dropped; it was like buried six feet deep. I just I, like this made me excited because I actually enjoyed this, this episode. They showed all kinds of, uh, like Drew Gulak is really coming out good. And, uh, just, I thought it was a great match, a great show real overall. All right. You ready for feedback? Yeah. I got nothing else to do today and I'm very lonely. As I said, well, let us, Oh, I got my glasses too. Oh, that's exciting. (laughs) First one up here, great way for Carmella to get added heat, not just her trashing Ellsworth, but also her in-ring conduct. Her screeching during matches would make anyone hate her, no matter how pretty she is. Amazing how Shane is so over with the crowd, I don't think it's just his propensity to jump off of stuff. Give the fans a little of what they want and don't look like a total tool. And bingo, too bad WWE can't apply those basic principles to some of their babyface wrestlers. That's a wonderful point to make, Mm -hmm. the fact that Shane is booked as this... He's put in the role of an authority figure that sees through everyone's shit. That no one gets one up on him. He stands up for himself. He doesn't take shit. And the audience respects him. And that's yeah. something you never want to make baby faces look like fools. And case in point, because it was the most recent example, Sasha Banks on Raw last week. Yeah, wow. Just... Where she was booked to look like a fool. Completely. And you wonder why these baby face look at Sasha Banks. I was thinking about this this morning of some of the situations she's put in. L- look at the fact all of her title reigns that, that have lasted a week or two. The fact that on top of that, you had the hell in a cell loss in her hometown yeah. clean at the iron woman match with Charlotte. She taps out with one second to go and then yeah. loses in overtime. <laughs> Like, why, as a 10-year-old fan, would you root for this person? Yeah, it, it's true. And like like you said on the show, like, <laughs> you had Alexa Bliss telling her, hey, you're a loser, you're going to lose, I'm going to beat you, and what happened? <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, the poor girl. Anyway, um, goes on to say, really like Corey on commentary, using his catchphrases. Catchphrases, if only Eva Marie returned. I'd love to hear Corey <laughs> yell, shut up, Tom, one more time. That was awesome. It will come. M- Mandy oh, Rose, sure. maybe, will be pegged for SmackDown. <laughs> we go to Ronaldo. Ziggler is turning into Damian Sandow, a bad version of it, and that's all I have to say about that. 
Yeah, it wasn't a great reintroduction of Mr. Taylor. <laughs> oh, God, no. Michael from Orange County. Owen's promo was great, especially when he incorporated the helicopter accident involving Shane. As always, Owen's is one of the highlights of SmackDown. Looks like Ziggler's gimmick is a wrestler with a gimmick crisis. Really disappointed with his return thus far. He's been a consistently great worker, but that may be to his detriment. I feel like they will just keep him in their back pocket at all times. Main event was fresh, very entertaining, even though we knew who was winning. The RKO reversal to the armbar was very smooth. What do you see Vince's role being next week? I hope we don't get the reintroduction of Stephanie in place of Shane. Do you see a replacement announced for Shane next week, Dave? Or, see, I feel this could eventually lead to Shane being brought back, not as a commissioner, but as a competitor for one night only to face Kevin Owens. Yeah, I would. I, I agree with you on that one. I can't see them bringing in Stephanie. Why would they bring in somebody else if if they're if it's going like they're saying that? Oh, uh, Owens is trying to get control of it. Shane is being put out, so you've still got two people that are vying for that position. So why bring in somebody else to just disregard those two? It, it didn't. It wouldn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I, you know what? Neither show is crying for a Stephanie return at the moment. Oh, no. When it's needed, it'll happen, but it's not at the moment. Definitely not. Uh, we go to Improbi. Improbi? Okay. Sure. Another, another great episode of SmackDown, even without the appearance of Brizango. Oh, yeah, that's right. We didn't see them tonight. It's been a while since I enjoyed a match featuring Randy Orton and Nakamura uh, since joining the SmackDown roster. Who knew two wrongs could make a right? Love the interplay between Shane, Shano and Owens. Almost made me look forward to seeing a match between the two. Almost. Lots of Daniel Bryan. Yes, yes, yes. Hooray. Not looking forward to seeing what they are doing with Dolph Ziggler. Vinnie Mac's constant uh, burial uh, burial of Zig- Ziggy over the years has made me lose interest. Speaking of Vince, hope he's regulated to just a couple of minutes next week. Keep his appearances on Raw where I never have to see him. <laughs> well, he will be in a big segment next week because that will oh, probably be, sure. one of be one of the key segments on the show. Oh, yeah. Okay, over to next one here. You know, if Brian really wanted to get out of his contract, he could have just said no when Vince asked him to suspend Shane. Good sure. addition of SmackDown. Well, that's not his character on TV, is that yeah. he is <laughs> eyeing a return to the ring. That's yeah. not the on-screen persona. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we go to Randy from Nantucket. So, just finished watching this show, and personally, I love both brands right now, which may not be uh, pop pinion. Pop pinion? Is that a new term? I don't know. We'll have not to ask. Be, not be popular opinion. Oh, gotcha. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, but am I wrong? But uh, but wasn't there talk about a roster shakeup in the weeks after SummerSlam? Oh yeah, I did hear that something like that. Or was that simply Cena moving over and Rude moving up? And I was expecting more. Either way, I'm happy. Just curious if you know, Mister Ting. You sounded great today. Just kidding. LOL. <laughs> and one more here. I just. Oh, yeah. rec- I just recommend you to watch 205 Live's main event. First time I hear people chanting, this is awesome, and actually reacting to what is going on in the ring. A very good match. Yep, that was noted. They did a very good job oh, in yeah. the main event. Uh, well put together match. Cedric looked very good in that match in particular. Uh, there, hey, there's a lot of talent in that division. That, to me, has never been the problem. It's been mm-hmm. a lot of the, the characters they've been given, a lot of the storylines that do a number on this audience and not making this show feel important every week. And that's why it's been a show that at times um, you don't have the same level of engagement as the others because it hasn't been positioned as such. But um, nonetheless, good main event tonight. And there is at least a modicum of enhanced interest, I think, with Enzo being on there as a pushed character and someone the audience is genuinely into, which is why I would not be so fast to turn him as they somewhat are teasing. Yeah, he's he's doing his job right now. He's getting people to to watch the product, and uh, I, I was impressed with the show today. And I thought uh, he had added a lot to it. Do you think that they could put the title on Enzo at No Mercy? No, but they could if they wanted to. But I think it would be a mistake. I think it'll depend on how the next few weeks are, and if you know if he really does start to add, you know, certain a certain level of interest to Two Five Live, they may they may feel they have a something here with Enzo and just go with him. Yep. I could see that. Yep. Why not? Well, mm-hmm. that is going to bring an end to the show uh, because I, I do have to pee. And <laughs> Dave, the the day is your oyster. I don't know uh, what you'll do today. Maybe you can go watch some May Young Classic or sit back and just chat with a juice box about life. Yeah. 
I, I think I might try that. Uh, if you want to come visit me, though, uh, I'm in Milton right now, but I'm usually at Bryden's at uh, 2455 Bloor Street West. Uh, and uh, you can follow us there at Bryden's on Bloor. You can follow me at Bartender Dave 74 And uh, if you're not sick of me yet, I'm doing what's next with Braden tomorrow. So there I am as well. And uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you very much, John, for having me uh, on. I really, really enjoy doing the show with you. Always great to have you on, Dave. And coming up later this week, we've got, uh, as Dave mentioned, he'll be on with Braden on Thursday with What's Next. The MMA report is also coming out tomorrow. I'll be joined by UFC women's bantamweight champion Amanda Nunez, who defends her title this Saturday in Edmonton at UFC 215. And then Friday, we have Review Away, where it's myself and Dan the Mouth Lavransky, and we're reviewing the recent uh, High Spots documentary on Bruiser Brody. Um, that is out at the High Spots Wrestling Network site that you can How go- good is that? Uh, you're going to find out on Friday oh. how good it was. Uh, but it's an easy, sh- uh, if you can either, uh, the way high spots is set up with their streaming service, it's $10 a month, but you also have the option. If you don't want to commit to, uh, a monthly, uh, contract or, uh, you know, agreement, mm-hmm. you can simply rent the documentary for, I believe four or five bucks, or you could just buy it for 10. So very easy to watch it if you don't want to sign up for another streaming service, but they've got a lot of great stuff up there. I was going through, you know, different live events. They have documentaries that they've done interviews. There's a lot on that high spots wrestling network that you can check out. So that is it for us. You can go to liveaudiowrestling.com, stay up to date on all of the news. And once again, Chris Jericho on the loss Sunday night, midnight Eastern start time. Dave Meltzer is also back on the show. And based on today, there will be no shortage of topics to cover Sunday (laughs) night. So tune into the law and we will speak with you later this week. 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 Speak with you later this week.